Listen, uh, we're in a series that we simply titled Don't Tell Anyone But. And we've talked about gossip. We've talked about having a critical spirit. Today, the title of this message in the series is simply conflict. How do we handle it? How do we deal with it? What does the Bible say about it? And the Bible has a lot to say about it. So what comes to mind when you hear the word conflict? Anger, fear, anxiety, a person's name, a person's face come to you, a memory of a past event, or a word spoken that you wanna forget but you don't seem to be able to. See, too many of us fear conflict. We dread it. We don't wanna deal with things. We wanna sweep them under the carpet. The problem with that is it's unhealthy for you as a person, it's unhealthy for families, it's just unhealthy when we don't resolve issues. And conflict really is meant to come to a resolution, an agreement, if you would. Where can we, where can we land that we can, both parties can be okay? And a lot of times in conflict, the reason we dread it is because people are trying to be right. And you can be so right and be wrong at the same time. And too many of us just wanna be right. We wanna get our way. Instead of finding out and listening and finding out how can we resolve issues to the point that we're peaceful with them. We may not get everything we want, but we get enough to say, okay, I'm good with that. And that's what brings peace to us. Merriam-Webster defines conflict as a clash between hostile or opposing elements, ideas or forces. If you've been married in here longer than a day, you have experienced this. And if you say you haven't, then you're not, you don't really have a marriage. I always laugh at the people who say, I've been married 35 years, never argued with my wife. Yeah, because you probably never talked to her. Because when you bring two people in, you know, <laughs> our opposites attract and then opposites attack. Come on. And e almost every one of us married our opposite. You see some guys are so nice and their wives are like, let's go. And then you see wives that are so sweet and their husbands are like, let's go, I don't wanna be around people. You know, whatever. <laughs> Conflicts contain disagreements, issues, arguments even, disputes and quarrels. In fact, those are words that describe conflict. So we're gonna have to have conflict. You know, when the last two and a half years or three years in the pandemic, when you know, I, I went after the governor, because who, who is supposed to speak to evil? The church is supposed to. And people say, well, I can't handle the conflict. Well, why not? You're gonna be in conflict anyway. And so we, we, we have to, you have to fight for your freedoms because people wanna take them away. And I, I just purpose, no one's gonna tell me how to worship God. Nobody is gonna tell me. I don't care if it's the president, I don't care if it's the king or whatever. Nobody's gonna tell me how to worship God no, or have church. Nobody. And, and people had a problem with that. Well, I think we should listen, what? To a bunch of misinformation and lies. Because nothing ever happened quite like they said. But there's conflict everywhere. You can't avoid it, it's inevitable. Some of you will drive out of our parking lot today and be in conflict with the first car that cuts you off. <laughs> or is driving in the left lane way too slow. I had one this morning, you know, I'm driving, he's driving in the left lane, I'm like, oh, come on, quit going the speed limit. <laughs> That's for the right lane. Proverbs 15:18. A hot-tempered person starts fights. A cool-tempered person stops them. So when we deal with conflict, we gotta be calm. You gotta start, you gotta calm yourself because if we're just angry, people quit listening to what you mean because all they know is you're mad. Same way with our children. You can be angry at your kids because we do get angry at them, but if that's how you correct them all the time, because we don't punish kids. Kids are kids. We punish criminals. We correct our children. And sometimes in correction you can get mad and you know when I disciplined my kids growing up when they were growing up, I tried never to be angry. I didn't want them to just know dad's mad, I want them to know they did something wrong. And that's the difference. And some of us need to understand this scripture, a hot tempered person starts fights. Folks, it's not healthy, God didn't make you that way, you became that way somehow, but you can work through it and be more calmer. We will all face conflict, but how we deal with it is important. Philippians chapter four, verses two and three, 
And now I want to plead with those dear women, Yodius and Sintiche, please, please, with the Lord's help, quarrel no more, be friends again. And I ask you, my true teammate, to help these women, for they worked side by side with me in telling the good news to others. And they worked with Clement, too, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. So the Apostle Paul begins to talk about this public fight. It was so public, um, this fight was so public um, that Paul even addressed it when he was in prison. He was in a Roman prison. He hears about this argument between these two women. It is so, it, it's so important for the unity of the Church of Philippi that Paul is now saying, please help these women work through their conflict, their issues. And that goes to the women question. Well, women shouldn't be doing this and women shouldn't be doing that. And, and you know, it's always the funny, the women, the people who have an issue with women doing anything in the church, they, they, they misinterpret the whole scripture. You know, the scripture says women be silent in the church. So if it meant what it's supposed to mean, if you just read it and, okay, that's what it means, then every lady that walked in here, you wouldn't be allowed to talk. Just like this. You wouldn't be able to say amen, laugh, because you can't talk. Now, I want any man in here, try that one on your wife. And we're all gonna take step backs to see how quick you are standing after that. Like, honey, we're in the church, don't talk. Because women keep silent in the church. And so Paul was using these women, he said, in fact, they were side by side sharing the good news. So, must not be bad. And without women, let me just say this, without women, we don't have a church. Because more women do work in this house than men, which is not a good thing. We should have, men should be taking their place also. Well, I'm too busy. Yeah, you're too busy doing with what God gave you. But we gotta come back and say thank you to him at some time and that we appreciate him. So Paul had heard about it even though he was currently in a Roman prison in chains. Two people fighting in this manner would have put the unity of the believers in Philippi in jeopardy. So it was important for Paul to address the bickering in his letter to the church. But the Bible says a lot about dealing with conflict. Let's look at Matthew chapter five, verses 23 and 24. So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, Leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. God is always trying to get us to fix things, to reconcile, because he knows when you do, you get more peaceful. Matthew 18, verses 15 and 16. If another believer sins against you, go privately. I want everybody to say privately. Let's say it again, privately. Online, say privately. Miracles happen, I'm telling you, Every time I do that, I can hear them. <laughs> you go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won the person back. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two, not 10, not all your Facebook friends, not all the people you've talked to, one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. Listen, conflict is unavoidable. And in the church world especially, this scripture needs to be honored. Because what happens in the church world is, someone does something, and instead of going to them, somebody goes to everybody else, say, did you know, did you see, did you hear? Or they come to the, the, you know, the staff or to me and say, hey, this is what happened. You need to go deal with that person. I'm saying, did you deal with that person? Then no, then I'm not dealing with them. You deal with them. You're the one that saw it. You're the one that knows. Why do you want me to deal with it? Because they don't want any conflict. And they don't understand the biblical principle. If you have an issue with somebody, why does God say go privately? So it's between you two and it can stop there and go no further. But people don't do that. That's why we talked about gossip in this series. People just wanna talk. They want someone else to go deal with them. Or they have this mentality, God will handle it. Well, if God was gonna handle everything, why did he put us on the earth? Why didn't God handle them mowing my yard? 
If I don't mow my yard, it looks a mess. If I don't water it, if we don't fertilize it, and put the whole things in it to irrigate it, then it, it doesn't turn out well. See, we want God to do everything that God told us to do. Why would he tell you to go to someone privately if he was gonna go to them privately? Now, he can deal with hearts and minds to get people to reconcile, but we go privately. When you have conflict, when you have issues, you go privately, and if they listen to you, then we're good, we got it all settled, we can move on. If it's not good, you take one or two more, not everybody else, and you deal with it privately as you can. God is not out to expose everybody's sin and their mistakes and their misfortune. He is not, even though that's what we think. I think God is always trying to work to get us to do better so things don't have to get exposed. But we hurt people. We hurt them in the church world especially by talking about them. If someone made a mistake, then so be it, because you've made mistakes. And it's funny, the people who talk the most are the people who like talking, uh, being talked about the least. They're the ones that get all butt hurt all the time. Who are you talking about me? Well, you talk about everybody. Why, are you, why aren't you happy with reaping your, your rewards and the seeds you've sown? We have people we know. Hey, if you want to tell, we'll just go tell them. Go tell them to tell nobody. They'll tell everybody. That's how you get information out in the church. Some say, who are they? We know. I'm kidding. <laughs> Conflict is unavoidable. But if we handle it correctly, it doesn't have to be bad. Conflict is an inevitable part of life and occurs naturally. You don't have to try to have it. It'll come during our daily lives. There will always be differences of opinions or disagreements between individuals and or groups, always. Because everybody has their own mind, everybody has an opinion. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warns that we must and should deal with conflict. Conflict should be handled quickly. Matthew 5, verse 25. When you are on your way to court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly. Otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge who will hand you over to the officer and you will be thrown into prison. Jesus is always trying to get believers especially to handle conflict. In marriages, the way you handle conflict so there's peace is to find places of agreement. But I've sat with so many couples that they just want to be right. It's my way, I'm the right way. Yeah, but he doesn't want to go that way or she doesn't want to go that way. So find another way. Oh no, we got to do it this way. Well, have at it. And the longer you do that and the more you stuff all the stuff that's not being settled, it, becomes, it can become bitterness and resentment. And, and that's why marriage is in. A lot of times after 10 or 15 years of being together, they end because we don't manage and handle conflict well, or we're always trying to win and be right. And that's why I said you can, you can be right and be wrong all at the same time. And so Jesus tells us, if you have an issue with somebody, settle it. Just settle it, get it settled. God gives us steps to dealing with and resolving conflict. And there are different types of conflicts that we'll all face. Conflict resolution strategies would be like don't ignore conflict. Don't ignore it. Clarify what the issue is. Bring involved parties together to talk. Identify a solution. In other words, what's the answer? I have people in the church world that have complained and complained and complained, and finally when we ask them, what is it you want? They don't even know. All they know is, I don't like what I'm seeing. Well, what do you want? I mean, people rag us, well, I didn't come to a concert. It's like we asked them. People come to our church and they'll call. First time, I, I came to church, I didn't expect to go to a concert. Well, <laughs> this is our church, not yours, buddy. You didn't pay for anything. Why do you even have a say? And here's the big thing, and I know this sounds bad. Why do you think we care? I mean, it's amazing, I, I, I thought about this. Why? I would never do that. I would never do that. But some people think that everybody wants to know what they think. And the truth is, we don't. No more than I care what the media thinks. Because they watch, they're watching now. 
or the governor. But people think they have a say in a right where they didn't pay to, when you don't pay for the furniture, why do you have a say in how we arrange it? But see, we don't want to hear these kind of messages because we want to continue to be petty. People have said, I don't like your worship, and I love this statement. Well, good, because we're not worshiping you. We're worshiping God. So hopefully God likes it. What you're saying is, I don't like your music. I don't like this. I don't like that. Thank you, too bad. But we need to identify a solution. What do you want? What, where, where do you wanna go? Don't blame or name call. When you're dealing with a conflict, man, when you start doing that, the, 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 the conversation's about over. Give information, and here's a big one. Listen, listen, and listen, and talk it through. That's how you resolve conflict. You don't hide it or bury it. You know, I, I've, I've watched families over many, many years that'll have like child molestation in their families. And I've watched this so often that somebody will get right with God, get their life right, get help, get healthy, and they'll tell the secret that's been in that family for generations. You understand those kind of secrets won't leave families until they're exposed and dealt with and, and removed from the family. You understand that. But I've watched people who are the ones that tell and the whole family will attack that person. And it's always amazing to me. They're attacking them for exposing something that's so heinous and so bad and so hurtful, but yet the family wants to hide it. You know why? Because they don't want to deal with any conflict. And it's unhealthy. It makes it more unhealthy. And that's the way you get rid of those things in your family. It doesn't matter what it is, you, you, you have to deal with it. May I say this? We don't resolve conflict over texting or Facebook. God says do it face to face, not Facebook to Facebook. And the thing I've learned about texting over the years is there's no emotion to it. You know, I text somebody and they'll, they'll just text one word back, no or whatever. So then I'm thinking, are they mad? Are they? I mean, you know, does it mean that they're mad? Are they, am I bugging them? Or does it mean just no? And it's hard to tell sometimes in text. That's why I, I have no respect for people that break up over text. Like, you know, I love you, but I don't love you, and I'm out, and see you later, and don't text me again. Over a text. I mean, who does that? And so we need to do it face to face. If I have an issue with you, let's deal with it face to face because then we can see the emotion of it. So if you say no, I can know how you say no. No, well then I know there's a problem. If you say no, then there's a, there's a different no. So we don't do it over texting. We don't resolve conflict over getting on social media and going at each other because most people that do that are dumb anyway. They don't even deal with the context of what we're dealing with. I've, I've read over things and I'm like, we weren't even talking about that. Where did that come from? Because you're not smart. And you think everybody wants to know your opinion. I love what they did on my social media. I don't do social media, my staff does. I love what they do. You can't even put a negative comment on there. You want to cuss me? You, it doesn't show up. Surprise, surprise, surprise. But we resolve things face to face. And part of resolving conflict is learning to listen and listen and listen. Listening is a huge part of resolving conflict. And we should never, and I'm gonna say it again, never go into it trying to be right. We should go into a conflict trying to find a resolution, a place of agreement where we can walk away peacefully. But we have to learn to listen. You know, a lot of times if we just listen to people, we can understand what they're saying even though they may not be saying it very well. Oh, I get it now, I understand what the problem is or the issue is. But a lot of times we won't listen because when we feel attacked, we stop listening. When you get defensive, you stop listening. Over the years I've taught our staff, you know, I said, hey, don't go after people, ask questions. Do what God did. 
The devil's the accuser of the brethren. And so Christian, let me say it this way. You are not, unless you're the devil, and of the devil, you should stop accusing the brethren. You should stop making accusations against the church. I love these so-called Christians that say, I won't go to church, it's just me and God, me and him. We're just in the mountains worshiping together. Not now you're not. It's cold up there. <laughs> they act like they're, you know, just a hippie from the 70s. With tie-dye shirts and beads and smoking pot up there with God in nature. It's dumb, it doesn't happen. Because if we saw a bunch of people up there, you went up the mountain, saw a bunch of oh, what's all right? <laughs> Just worshiping in nature. Doesn't make any sense. But they accuse the church. And really what they're accusing is not a name, is not a building, they're accusing everybody that makes up the church. It's just so sad. Well, I went to church and someone was mean to me. Oh my gosh, has anybody been mean to you your whole life? Yeah, all the time. Well, why is it so bad in the church? Well, they should be different. Why should we be different? We're just, we're sinners working through our salvation. Come on. I mean, we, we, have, a, we have a lot of issues in here. And not everybody's gonna be like, hey, praise God, hallelujah, oh man. I'm gonna sit out of the spot where the glory pours out. You know, they're, they're not doing that. They're probably crawling in here half, you know, halfway thinking I'm, my life is miserable, nothing's working out, and here I come to church, and here comes this Christian like, hey, good to see you, Frank, way, way to go, brother, and we hug, and they're like, oh, no, 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 I don't feel like that today, because we're human beings. Just because you're a Christian doesn't make you perfect, and doesn't make you godly either. We have to work through some of that. That's why you can't get upset. The reason God has the church so you can serve and work, so you can learn how to deal with conflict, so when you go in the world, you can handle it better. It's funny, we wanna quit church, but we don't wanna quit our jobs, we don't quit life, we, we just, only church. Well, I got offended at church. Someone said something at church, or someone didn't talk to me at church. Like, maybe they don't like you. <laughs> maybe they didn't see you. Maybe they're preoccupied with their own life because a lot's going on in there. I mean, how do you know? And why do we take so offense to it? Doesn't the Bible say those that love the law of God in Psalm 119, 165, those who love the law of God, those who love this word of God, here's what the Bible says, nothing, everybody say nothing. Nothing, nothing shall offend them. So if you're a believer, why are you getting offended all the time? <laughs> I like talking like this. All right, here we go. <laughs> Proverbs 15, 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stirs up anger. We got to learn to talk a little quieter, talk a little kinder to deal with issues. So there's two basic types of conflict, internal and external conflict. There is internal conflict. Jesus faced this in the garden. Didn't he, when he was at the garden praying, and he said, God, if this cup can pass before me, that's conflict. He was conflicted internally. But then he ended up saying, nevertheless, not my will, God, but your will. And you and I will have internal conflict. Man, I wanna do this, but I know I shouldn't. How many of you have ever done something you shouldn't have done? Come on. Yeah, if you didn't raise your hand, you just messed up. And how many have had that internal conflict like, I, my flesh really wants to, but man, I know God's word says this, but man, I wanna say this because I'm so mad, but I know I shouldn't. Anybody have had that kind of fight? Yeah, and so there's conflict, so that's eternal conflict. Jesus had the same conflict. He, he knew what was gonna happen. People think Jesus went to the cross like, I can't wait to be beat and crucified and humiliated and my whole flesh stripped off my body. That's why I get bugged over the pictures of Jesus they show on a cross. Little old effeminate Jesus up there like this. Little blood trickling down his head. They bug me. We have so effeminized Jesus, it's sickening. It's sickening. Why don't we show him like he really looked like? Because you wouldn't even be able to tell if it was a human being. That's the Jesus I'll follow. That's the Jesus we should all follow. 
I mean, can you imagine his flesh ripped off his whole body? The cat of nine tails, when they'd whip him, it would, it would dig in and it would just rip the skin off. And so even the passion of the Christ doesn't do justice of what Jesus really looked like. And I, I brought people to that movie. And when Jesus was being beaten and crucified, they turned away. And in tears looked at me, grown man in tears said, I can't watch this. Well, that's not even close to what happened to him. You couldn't tell it was a human being. That's why the Bible says he was more marred than any other person in the world and died the most horrific death you could die. And he's like, God, if, you, if this cup can pass from me, please. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. That's the internal conflict. We all have it. We all face it. Jesus won. And a lot of times we don't. It's just our human nature. That's why God says repent. There's workplace conflict, family conflict. Conflict with your spouse, church worker, conflict. Those are external. Internal conflict is when we struggle with our own opposing desires. And we understand conflict is inevitable. It's best as if we work through and resolve them, though. That's where you get peace, folks. That's where you find, I tell young couples all the time they get married, have all your train wrecks early in your marriage. Don't hide things. Don't sweep them under the carpet. And they always look at me and said, why should we have all of our train wrecks at the beginning? I said, because you're, you're in love. You, you tr you're like giddy love, like that you know, newlywed love, that honeymoon love, like Tarzan and Jane love. <laughs> Meet Tarzan, you Jane. Oh, you know. It's when you're young enough to still swing from the chandeliers. You get older, you look and think, memories. <laughs> I know, I know. Not dealing properly with conflict can cause a person from enjoying life, period. Because you're constantly angry, sad, grieving, or yearning for closure. And when you avoid dealing with conflict, you're compromising your true feelings and storing up frustration that can negatively affect your health. And I'm not talking about going and blasting people. I'm talking about if we have real issues with folks, just sitting down talking to them. Now you may never be friends with them again, but at least you can be peaceful when you walk away. Like, okay, they listen to me, they apologize, I apologize, we move on but we have to resolve this stuff. See, we should run to resolve conflict, purposing to find a place of agreement, folks. That's what we should do. That's what all of us should do. Conflict will happen in all of our lives. We can't avoid it. You try, but you can't. It can happen and creep up in any moment. But what do I do? Do I run and hide? Do I say I'm just not that person? I'm not a confrontational? You don't have to be that confrontational. You just have to be willing to talk and listen and hear what people are saying because sometimes when you understand where they're coming from, it's easier for you to understand their actions or their words or things they've said and done. But we, probably, we, we have a hard time in our culture giving people the benefit of the doubt. We hate success for some reason in this country. I still love success. I love success stories. I don't want people to fail. I don't because I don't want to fail. And people are just rejoicing when people fall and they, 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 you know, they hurt themselves or humiliate themselves. I don't rejoice at that. Why? Because God doesn't rejoice at that. So you and I have to decide. Are we gonna work through things? Are we just gonna harbor them, store them, stuff them until they come out in a very ugly way? How many of you waited, you know, if you're like me, with like my wife and I, she'll just deal with things up front. I have to let them like simmer in a bad way. Like, she'll say something, do something, I'm like, okay, I'll let it go. Then she does it again, I'll let it go. Then something happens again, and I let it go. And then, 
one day it goes and it's like, what are you doing? Quit talking to me like that. Quit saying things or whatever it might be. And then my wife will say to me, because I'll get all worked up and angry and she'll stay calm, which ticks me off. And then she'll say, why didn't you just tell me when I did it? And the truth is, because I didn't have the guts. I didn't want the conflict. And probably had I just said it when it happened, it would have been easy, like, please, Cynthia, don't do that again or don't say that way to me again or whatever. She would have probably went, okay. But I wait till I get angry. That's the problem. Because then we say things that, that I, I, I see this picture all the time. Words coming out and us going after them like, no. <laughs> and once they said, they're said. And if you're, and you know, women have memories like elephants. I mean, it's funny. My wife can bring up the, you said this on this day at this time. I'm like, did I? <laughs> yes, you did. Well, I have no defense, so it must be true. That's what's unfair about women and men. I always laugh at this. Women can tell you times and dates. Men are guys, men will be like, you know you did it. And then the wife, they're smart, be like, when did I do that? Well, you know, sometime. Because we have no idea. We just know it happened at some point. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? See, some of y'all know. Some of y'all are tough. But if we handle conflict well, the way God's word says, we'll be more peaceful in our own lives. And isn't that what we're striving for is just peace? Too many people are striving for happiness, but happiness is fleeting. What we need to be striving for is fulfillment. It's like the moving forward class. I recommend it to anybody and everybody because it'll help you live a satisfied life, not just a saved life. And too many believers are living saved lives. They're saved, but they're not happy. They're not satisfied. It's not good. It's just existing. And I don't know about you, I don't want to exist anymore. I want to live. So let's live. Let's live together. Let's work through issues. Let's be the church where people come and that knows. Man, you come here, you have an issue, you better go deal with it because they're not going to deal with it for you. And if you haven't talked to them first, then why would I go with you? Let's just work at it. Practice it. Watch how God moves in your life because I believe he'll bless you. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your truth. I thank you for being here. I thank you for all the wonderful gifts and blessings that you put in our hands. If it's just a few blessings, God, then I pray that we manage those blessings and steward them in a great way that you can add even more. If you've given them lots of gifts and talents, may they use them for your glory. May they honor you with them. But most of all, God, I thank you for dealing with hearts and minds to change our thinking to give us the boldness, the courage, the wisdom to navigate in this life. So difficult at times. People are unreasonable and it's hard to deal with unreasonable people. You can't reason with them. But God, we can, we can try to put things to rest and resolve conflict and resolve issues and disagreements in a better way. One that doesn't bring reproach on the kingdom one that doesn't hurt the body, but it just moves forward. Thank you, Father, for teaching us your ways and then not only teach us that we would act on them in the precious name of Jesus. If you're here with every head bowed and you say, preacher, would you pray with me? I walked with God, but I walked away. But today I'm coming home. Or preacher, would you pray with me? I've never asked Jesus to be Lord of my life, but I'm willing to today. I don't even know why. I can help you with that. Because I believe from the beginning of this service to now, the Spirit of God's been dealing with hearts and minds to get you to come back to his family and to be part of his family. And it's up to you to respond. And I hope you respond yes. I hope you respond in a way that it's so quick and so easy. Because God does care and he does love people. But you'll never experience his love until you say yes to him. Not truly. And he'll work with you. He'll receive you just like you are. But he has a plan for you to do better, be better, live better. We just have to learn his word and follow that. Will we do it perfectly? No. That's thank God we can repent though. I always say this. Christians should be the most professional repenters in the world. It shouldn't be hard for us to say, God, I missed it. God, I blew it. And if, we're, if it's easy for us to repent to God, it'll be easy for us to take the high road with others even when it's not our fault, if it resolves conflict, 
you know what, I'm sorry for my part in this. Whatever it takes to resolve it, whatever it takes to bring peace into our lives as well as the lives of others and the life of the church. Because where unresolved conflict is, there's always strife. And where there's strife, there's every evil work. And God doesn't want that in your life. He doesn't want it in the church. And the only way for us to come to him is humbly. We come to him with a humble heart. Doesn't matter what your station in life is. To say yes to Jesus is just what he wants you to do. We come to him with a humble heart, not with a prideful heart. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And I don't know about you, I need his grace more now than ever. This is a crazy world we live in. God, we need your grace and mercy. So if you're here with, at the sound of my voice, whether you're online or in here, and I know some of the other campuses have turned it over to the campus pastors, and you say, preacher, would you pray with me? I'm in one of those two spiritual conditions, right where you're seated. I'm not gonna ask you to do a whole lot, but I'm gonna ask you to do something. And it's so simple, but it's really profound. I truly believe it. Jesus said, if we confess him before men, he'll confess us before our Father in heaven. And this is a form of confession. Just a simple thing I'm gonna ask you to do is saying to people, I don't care what you think, I don't care what anybody else thinks, God, I just want you in my life. If that's you, in Jesus' name, right where you're seated, are you ready? With no hesitation. And you say, Pastor Steve, would you pray with me? I'm ready to get my life right, or I'm ready to give Jesus permission to my life. I don't even know what all that means, but I just know it's right. If that's you in Jesus' holy name, right where you're seated, are you ready? Right now, in Jesus' name, would you just lift your hand and say, Preacher, would you include me in your prayer? I want to get it right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, young man. Thank you. Thank you over here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you at the top. God bless you. God bless you over here. Thank you. I'm going to look across the top. Who else would say yes to Jesus? Thank you. God bless you. So I see your hand top. God bless you guys. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you over here. Thank you. Anybody else as I look across the top? We're all going to pray together, guys. I'm just trying to get you to acknowledge. And, and the studies will show that if you're willing just to leave and lift your hand, it'll help you walk with God as you leave this place. Because everybody in here is for you. No one's here to condemn you or to say, I can't believe you lifted your hand. Hey, that's what we do to get it right. And the other thing I want to talk to is a few men. It's a man's church. And what I mean by that is we let men get saved and stay men. We don't try to feminize you. I have said this all the time. For boys, when we're five, six, ten, there's things that are funny to us. And when you're 60, they're still funny. Because men, we never have to fully grow up. But we want you to be man. We want you to be a manly man. That's what God wants. The church has forever tried to feminize men. And, you know, that, that's where that comes. Well, you got to get in touch with the feminine side. And I, for some of you men in here, I've said this a, a bunch of times. I, I only have one feminine side. Her name is Cynthia. And I try to get in touch with her as often as she lets me. But that's the only feminine side I'm getting in touch with. I'm not getting, I don't have a fem. Well, we got to think more feminine. No, we don't. We need to think the way God tells us to think, to renew our thinking. So I want to say this one more time. Is there anybody in here that's a man? Maybe you're a lady. And you say, okay. I need to give my life to the Lord. Anybody else before I look around? I want to see if I see a hand. Because I always go after men. Anybody? I'm looking around. If they also have it. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. See, God wants to help people, not hurt them. Now I'm gonna ask that you pray this prayer loud with me. If you lifted your hand, play it loud enough for your ears to hear your voice. The Bible says we believe in our heart and confess with our mouths. And I want everybody in here that's right with God to join with us in supporting them. And if you didn't raise your hand, but you should have, we're gonna introduce you to Jesus. This church can't save anybody. Your denomination can't save anybody. Your grandparents, your parents, your family, the preacher, we can't save anybody. Only God can do that. And that's by us submitting our will to his. Are you ready? Would you pray this with me? Would you pray, Father, I choose to believe in Jesus. And I believe he's your son. And I believe you raised him from the dead to give me a new life. So with my heart, according to your word, 
I choose to believe that. Now with my mouth, I willingly confess, Jesus, be Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. I choose you, God. Help me in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. Let's thank the Lord, church.